You know, for those of us who profess to be a Christian, our Christianity has to be more than just meeting today on the Sabbath. It has to be more than just observing the festival seasons as they come from time to time as God has laid them out as a you know, purveyor of His, His work for each of us, the kingdom to come. It has to be more than just a collection of rituals and of memories. Christianity has to be, in effect, like a camera lens or a, a filter through which we strive to view everything that we do, all things in our life. Not just as we see the universe that's been created by our Creator, but also His purpose for each of us. Every day, and in everything that we do or say or even think, we need to, to the best of our ability, run through, as it were, this filter or this lens on how we see things. Now, granted, it is and can be difficult at times to fully comprehend the plan that God has for each of us. After all, how are we to discern our minuscule role in the enormity of His, in fact, universal creation? Even in effect in our own home and family, it's so easy to be distracted by the challenges of the daily demands that come our way. Uh, I don't have to enumerate those to you. You're well aware of them. You're well aware of what comes up in your own life, the things that come along that sometimes pull us to the side, take our attention, and go in a different direction. All this becomes easy, or makes it easy sometimes, to neglect or even to forget God's true and directed purpose for each of us. On top of that, in our efforts to, in effect, maintain a, a godly life, for those of us who are married, we strive to have a godly marriage, to try to rear our children, if we have children, in, in a way that will be according to God's way. We strive to manage then our home and our job and mix all these together. Uh, for those of you that are still working, I'm sorry. Uh, those of us that are retired, we're not having to manage the job aspect of it anymore. I, I, I'm like several others have told me, I wonder now how I ever got anything done when I was working. Because the, the day seems to fill up as it is just you know, with the things that I'm doing now. I don't know if I've, whether I've gotten lazier, slower, or both. But uh, one of the two must be part of the, the answer to that. But as we try to manage these things and, and going about it, if you have children, this, I don't have to tell you this, they all have distinct personalities. And add to that, they're usually, especially as older they get, they're often 19 different directions. Uh, somebody in the, in the family, normally the, the wife can become a taxi driver. That's your goal in life, to keep shuffling people off to different places, trying to keep up with who's supposed to be where and when. So it, it's so many things that come up in our life to distract us, to keep our mind off of where we should be going. You know, over the years I've had discussions, many discussions in fact, with people who feel that they have, for lack of a better word, and for many reasons, expressed it in, they have lost their way. Some time ago I had a discussion <clears throat> with a young teen. For many, many years we have had a, a teen summer camp and got to know a lot of these young people. But I had a, a conversation with one of them, a, a young man who was very bright, extremely intelligent, and I think, and he has proven since that time to be an extremely faithful young man, who had some really, what I thought, difficult questions. He told me that sometimes he feels like he loses his bearing as a Christian, that he feels somewhat lost and even somewhat sometimes disconnected from God. And that this, as it were, separation from God causes him anxiety in his life because he knows that's not what he wants, that's not what it should be. And it distresses him. And he really sometimes, he told me in this particular case, he did not know exactly what to do to conquer this or to overcome it. And we had a, we had a really good discussion, and we'll talk about this as we go through. But I told him that similarly in my own life, there have, there have been times in my life that I have felt, temporarily at least, detached or somehow disconnected from God. Now, I have found that in all of those times, I struggle with questions sometimes about the meaning of life, the purpose in life, the direction of my own life. 
And that this is something that, from my discussions with many other people over the years, I think is common to most all of us as Christians, at least from time to time. I don't mean something that we struggle with on a daily basis, but as things come along, as life gets harried, as problems come up, illnesses, sicknesses, financial distress, you know, you go through all the things that happen in life. And every one of you have been through any number of those, you know, loss of a job, a loss of a loved one, these that bring along distractions and distresses in our life. What I have learned about the times that I have been disconnected from God over a considerable period of time, and sometimes with a great deal of my own personal distress, is that, that separation is almost always, in fact, I think I could say always the result of my looking to the world for a purpose in my life, as opposed to looking to God. Inevitably, after some time, some period of, of you know, passage of time and consternation that comes along with it, I finally come to the reality that I think for all of us, our cultural compass, I hope you know what I mean by that, I think you'll get it as I go through, our cultural compass is perpetually disorienting. Have you ever tried to use a compass that was broke? doesn't give you too good of directions. You'll think you're going in one direction, you're actually going in another one. I don't know how many of you have ever been lost in the woods, uh, but if you have, you'll understand this story a little bit better. This, it can be extremely disorienting to be in, in woods sometimes and, and to get lost. Um, if, you, if you have a compass and you know how to use it, you're okay, but if the compass is broke, you know, you're, in, you're in a tough situation. Years ago when I was growing up, um, I think I was probably 11 or so, 12 at the time, uh, I was staying with my cousin out in the country, and the neighbors across the street ran a dairy. And they had three brothers that worked with their dad in the dairy. The oldest one was full of mischief. I won't tell you all of the things that we went through, but let's just say he had a lot of mischief in mind. He asked me one day if I would like to go snipe hunting. Any of you ever gone snipe hunting? Few of you have gone snipe. Now, you know there is actually a bird called a snipe, okay? And I thought that's what he meant. He had a different snipe in mind. And that's probably the one, the one that you are laughing or laughing about. He gave me a big feed sack that they put the feed in to feed the cows over the dairy. And this is what we were going to use to catch the snipe. Well, we went out in the woods late in the afternoon because he said this was the best time to catch them. It was almost dark. And then he told me to go in a certain way and he was going to go in a different way and we were going to meet back up. Well, I went in my way with my sack. He went the other way. He went out of the woods. I went into the woods. And then it got dark. And I was in woods. I didn't really know where I was. And I got totally, absolutely, and completely turned around. After about 30, 45 minutes, I was beginning to get a little bit concerned because I didn't know which way to go. And it was dark as it could be. It was pitch black. And I was in an area I wasn't real, you know, real familiar with, and I didn't know what to do. Um, I did remember um, a couple of things that I finally was able to get out of the woods after about an hour or so. Uh, I, w I just kept walking until I got out of the woods in that particular case. That was extremely disconcerting, disorienting, when you get in that kind of a situation. I ran into another situation similar to that. A friend of mine and I were hunting in Colorado years ago. And it, when we got up that morning, it was already snowing. But it was the last day to hunt. We both had not tagged out, so we wanted to try to tag out. We knew an area we wanted to go to. So we drove up to this particular area, got out of the truck, and started hunting. We spread out about, oh, I don't know, 200 feet apart, whatever, going through so we could sort of keep contact with one another a little bit. We both had compasses. But it began to snow harder and harder and harder to the point where it was basically a whiteout. And we kept going and kept going, and we finally got to a point where we realized nothing smart is going to be out in this weather. No deer, no elk. <laughs> we're out here, but all the game have gone and hidden somewhere, and we're stupid being where we are. So we head back toward the truck. Thankfully, we both had compasses, and we both knew how to you know, read them, how to use them, and we made it back to the truck, but it was a struggle even then. So what I'm saying is, in comparing this, it is so easy in life to have that same situation of getting disoriented, of being lost, and not knowing which way to turn unless you have a compass to guide you. 
something to orient you to the direction that you should go. The contemporary culture that we live in today relentlessly encourages us, even seduces us. And I think Buddy made mention of that to some extent even in his prayer. It, it wants us to link our identity. It wants us to link everything that we do, its attractions to its temptations, what we do, the possessions that we have, who we associate with, how we talk, and all the rest of our daily life, if we're not careful, can get onto that cultural compass and disorient us. We lose focus. The movies that are out today, the programs that are on TV, you name it, everything that's out there is designed to basically disorient us from God. There's very little that comes along in the arts anymore that's in any way redeeming. Uh, occasionally you see one from time to time uh, that is, and we, I try to see a few of those. But for the most part, uh, you see some t shows coming up on uh, television. I saw one the other night. It was called The Whisperers. I knew right away, I don't want to watch that. It's not something I want to even look at to spend any time with. But all of these connections and all of these bearings that we take from and attachments that we take from society are temporary. They're worldly and they're perishing. And in the end, if we take our bearings, if we take our direction, if we use them as our compass from this culture around us, we are inevitably destined to experience desolation, an emptiness, uh, a lost feeling of being lost, and it's when we offer, this world offers us these things to fill our lives with all of its distractions, with all of its forms of seductions and sedation, it in effect can, if we're not careful, lull us to sleep and in a sense away from God. But you know, it's also through the trials that you and I go through in life that we learn. God gives us tests and trials from time to time. Now, too often, I'm afraid, we blame too much on God when we're very capable of creating our own messes. God doesn't have to do anything in most cases. We create enough of our own messes in life, and then He helps us out of them. But, you know, we must look up before we look out on the world around us. We must look to God first in order to understand His purpose for us in this world. Indeed, if we try to define our purpose in the modern culture that we see around us, um, we're lost. Or worse, if we even try to understand God through the world's lens, we are destined, without any qualification, to remain separated and astray from Him. You probably all are familiar with the scripture over in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8, for it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Eternal. The question was then asked of me by this young man. So how do we even know that God is there? Now he asked, he asked that, with, as again, this is a young man that I've known for many, many years, and I knew he believed in God, and I knew he worshipped God, and he was doing his best to try to understand things in his life. In Hebrews chapter 11, and verse 1, of course it's known as the, the faith chapter, it says, Now faith is the substance of things that are hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If I might, I'd like to paraphrase that by saying, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not and cannot see. The Bible tells us no one has seen God. Yet all we have to do is look around in creation, look around even in our own lives and see what has happened to know that God is there. However, I would like to also offer to us that in those times when we sense, in effect, the absence of God in our lives, that we feel like there's something missing, that we're going in the wrong direction, that sense of loss itself is a strong, a very strong affirmation of God's presence. Because, in effect, God has built into all of us a desire to know Him and to be in unity with Him. And when we're not... And then when we fill ourselves with the void, the void that we have, 
with, with the fodder that comes our way and the garbage from the culture around us. The, empty, the emptiness and the loneliness that we feel then is plain and simple confirmation of God's presence and of the Holy Spirit working within us. Even the fact that we feel lonely, we feel absence, we feel lost, we feel a void, is that ability within us seeking, trying to seek God even at that time. I think a good metaphor for God's presence in our lives on even the bleakest of days is flying. Now, Benny will have to correct me on this if I get off the course, and I'm sure he will, but anyway, uh, as, a, as an experienced pilot. But you know, at certain times of the year, there's a lot more inclement weather. Witness here lately when the sun has been, you know, not around a lot. But even in the worst weather, with virtually no vis visibility at ground level, after you take off, several minutes after takeoff, you climb out above the cloud cover into clear skies and what may be seemingly at that particular time endless visibility, at least forward and to the side, but not, you know, not down. This emergence into the blue skies from the dense and the, the rough skies that you've come out of can and is awe-inspiring. If you've ever experienced that or not, you take off. I remember taking off one time from Dallas-Fort Worth, and uh, it was overcast and cloudy and rainy and everything else. But we took off, and then after... I forgotten how long it was. We came out and the sun was shining and just, you know, beautiful up there. Uh, years ago, I was in Colorado hunting again and we were leaving Durango, Colorado. And it was going to be uh, IFR conditions uh, the whole way, but we were finally given clearance to take off. But we hit it, and Benny, you'll have to help me on this if I get it wrong, an inversion layer where when we first took off, everything was fine, but we hit a layer of icing. And immediately the controls started icing up and the de-icer would not work properly. And the further, the higher we went, the worse it got. And the pilot said, you know, unless we get out of this in X number of seconds or minutes, whatever it was he said, we've got some major problems coming our way. And there were quite a few prayers said about that particular time. And then after a short period of time, it seemed like an hour, but I'm sure it was only seconds, we emerged and hit the blue sky and everything, the controls came back and we were okay. It, it, was a, it was a feeling that's hard to describe when you think we're fixing to turn around and go down faster than we came up uh, when that was happening. And, but when you get into that blue sky all of a sudden, it's just like, you know, that weight has been taken off of your shoulders. The, the fear is gone. Everything is, is back to normal. And, you know, sometimes here in winter, and here lately in the springtime, we're shrouded in clouds that can settle in for days and even sometimes weeks at a time. This absence of sun and blue sky can take its toll on the spirit. I've heard a lot of people over the last several weeks talking about how you know, it's easy to get disconcerted and down and everything else in this uh, none, no sun out, always uh, cloudy skies. Some of you that have lived in, in some of the mountainous or northern climes may have been more uh, used to that in the sense that you'd had it maybe more than we did down here in the south. But it's always a source of great comfort to remember that above the clouds, the sun and the stars are shining. They're always shining. They're shining bright. And that eventually this weather will break and the light from the heavens will be, you know, will be there, be shining again. And even we, in, in the sense of with God, we know, and I think every one of us understand and believe, that God is always there. Even if he's temporarily obscured by some of the things that we've been distracted by, if our vision has somehow been clouded. You know, sometimes in, in the early years of the world exploration, many of you are probably familiar with these stories anyway, have read them. The travelers who came along in little bitty ships across vast oceans set their course by the North Star. And when we make God, in effect, our North Star, then we can be guided precisely along the way that He has prepared for us. But at the same time, we don't always know where He's leading us. If I took a show of hands right now, how many of you knew from day one you know, exactly where you were going, where God was leading you, where you were going to end up and everything else? I don't think there'd be too many hands that would raise. Mine wouldn't go up. I even gave a series of Bible studies and sermons years ago um, concerning that particular subject. And because I was trying to, at that particular time in my own life, trying to struggle with, you know, where do I go from here? Why has God called me? That was the name of it, you know. 
what, what am I supposed to be doing? Where do I go from here? Even though we do not always know where God is leading us, we do know, as was the case with the early explorers, if we lose sight of Him as our guiding star, then somehow or another we need to get back in touch with that star and hold steady in our direction until we find you know, where it is that He is leading us. God is the true light. And Jesus Christ is the light of life. Those words are actually used in the verses we're going to go through in a minute. And then once we have that, we can correct our course and carry on in the direction and the calling that God has given to us. No matter how dark, no matter how difficult, no matter how tried we feel that we are being tested, God is there. He always has been. He always will be. I had a matter in my own family that had come up that we had been praying about for some time and was a little bit concerned about. But God answered the prayer and everything worked out fine. It was an answer to prayer. Did I have some doubts along the way? Yes and no. I knew God would answer the prayer. But you know, sometimes we, we build Him into a box, and I've said this before, and we want the answer in a certain way, and we want it now. But He answered it in time, and the way it, we hoped it would be answered. You know, from a strictly uh, scientific standpoint, there is no such thing as darkness. Darkness is simply the, simply, or is simply the absence of light. So darkness, in effect, doesn't exist. It just means that temporarily, light has been taken away. But you know, in our lives as Christians, as those who are followers of Jesus Christ, who is the light of life, we can overtake darkness only if we open our eyes. In Isaiah chapter 59, in verse 9 it says, So justice is far from us, and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in the shadows, in the deep shadows. Like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like men without eyes. At midday we stumble as if it were twilight among the strong, we are like the dead. Have you ever felt that way? You were struggling through life. You were wandering along not knowing exactly where you were going. But when we do open the eyes of our heart, in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2, it says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You know, I don't know if there's any more peaceful, promising, enjoyable time of the day than sunrise. There's been many times I've been on a duck blind or in a deer stand or some other hunting venue and watched the sun come up. Especially if you're about to freeze to death standing, you know, waist deep in ice water that you actually broke ice on to put decoys out in. That sun, even though it's, it hadn't gotten any warmer when it comes up, it warms you up. Or you're shaking your, you know, your knees off in a, duck, in a deer stand and freezing to death, but uh, the sun just brightens you up and warms you up. There's another scripture found over in Psalms chapter 97, verse 11. It says, Light is shed upon the righteous, and the joy on the upright in heart. And one more in Psalms chapter 27, and verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom Shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When God is our North Star, when He is there, when we are letting Jesus Christ be the light of our life, we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to be afraid of. For they are always there, and they always will be. Yeah, there are times that things get a little bit unsettled, that we get a little bit, you know, um, disturbed. 
But at the same time, we've got to always keep in mind that they are there and they always will be. I don't think it's any small irony that there was a bright star that guided the wise men from the east to the Christ child in Jerusalem. The story is in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 9. It says, When they had heard King Herod, if you remember the story, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. We know that the birth of Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of so many prophecies throughout the Bible, the prophecies of old, and foretold also in His own time. In John chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, The true light, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Jesus Himself described Himself in terms of light. In John chapter 8 and verse 12, it says, Then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The light of life. And to those who follow Him, He instructed, not only then, but just as well today, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, you, you and I, are the light of this world. It says, A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and then put it under a bushel basket, but they put it on a candlestick so that it can give light unto all that are in the house. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and then glorify your Father which is in heaven. If we're lost, if we have lost the light, how can we let our light shine? I told this young man that even on the brightest of days, with my eyes wide open, there is much about God that still remains a mystery to me. However, these unknowns caused me no trepidation. Long ago I discovered that I could not hope to fully comprehend the entire length and breadth of our Creator, who is infinite in His wisdom and in everything else. But we must come to know Him on His own terms and the way He wants us to know Him. In Jeremiah chapter 9, in verse 23, it says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. You know, in my conversations with this young man about knowing God and understanding His purpose for him, I told him that these kinds of situations, scenarios, times will continue throughout our lives. And that I was very grateful for the opportunity to share with him a little bit of the things that I had learned as I had gone through life. Because I think it speaks to the heart of a universal desire of each of us to know our Creator. I think all of mankind has that desire. You hear people talking about, they go to a psychologist or whoever they go to, they're searching for something in their life. So many people use that word, they're lost, they're searching, they're looking, they're trying to find something in their life. And it is that innate desire within all of us to know God, to know His purpose for us, but most people recognize it as something else. Not all know the way. And you know, that is where you and I come in. Where we have a more defined and specific role in our lives. We have been called to show others the way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse 26, it says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many noble, not many mighty, are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. 
and the base things of the world and the things which are despised has God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are. God has called each of us. I don't know what your purpose in life is, other than the broad spectrum we've just covered today. But I know we're all seeking to find that. We're all seeking to find Jesus Christ and to serve Him in every aspect of our life, in every phase of our life. But in the midst of our daily activities, as we go through life on a daily basis, we should always try to make a point to come together as a family. Just as we have here today as a church family, but also as our physical families. And when we give thanks for God's provision, we should always pray with a grateful heart and with a joyful spirit as a reflection of that gratitude and for the opportunity to be a part of such a great and important work that we have the opportunity to be a part of. This kind of a prayer, I believe, draws upon the very essence of Christianity. It calls upon the very essence of God's gift to each of us, of who we are supposed to be, a light guiding others, guiding others to the light of life. There's a scripture found over in Psalms 119, verse 105, and I'm sure most of you have it memorized. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In those moments when we feel apart from God and we seem to have lost our way or temporarily just sort of got sidetracked, if we ask ourselves, who or what am I serving? That question will inevitably lead us to examine maybe the, the bait or the allure and the culture around us that we have temporarily followed. And then we'll be able to, you know, once again call upon opening our eyes and seeing the true life and getting God back as our North Star. Always remember, as we do when we give thanks, and in closing I would like to share with you a song that I think really expresses, don't worry, I'm not going to sing it, so you're, you're okay there, no, 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 no problems. I think a song that expresses how we should always give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to God for giving us Jesus Christ, who is the true light of life. <laughs>